the brightest minds in, of our generation in the world are figuring out how to get you to continue scrolling on apps. Like they're not landing people on the moon. They're not like inventing cures for, you know, uh, diseases. They're like getting you to figure out, they're figuring out how to get you to stay on the app longer and hit more scrolls. JK, thanks for coming on. Uh, you, you, uh, you know, I've kind of done some research on you. You've done some interesting stuff. You built a big Twitter following, and now you teach people how to monetize their Twitter followings. You teach uh, teach people, and uh, you know, your your kind of uh, your your core skill is getting people to click buttons. So uh, I'm curious how that all evolved, how you got to uh, what you're doing today, and what the uh, kind of preface was for you getting into this digital marketing and kind of like conversion optimization space that you're in. Appreciate it for the intro, man. So um, yeah, so I built the the Twitter account when I was kind of in 2020. That's when I started. Just started tweeting, tweeting, tweeting. And um, like the main reason why I wanted to start because I saw so many people making good money, right? I wanted to make money as well. But uh, I reached a point where I got to like, 10k followers right and people told me okay at 10k you're gonna make good money i'm like okay great then i got to 20k right and it's like nothing happened and then i got to like 50 and 70k and like the income didn't change as much so i was like okay what the hell's going on right and um that's when i really like kind of had a big breakthrough moment when i realized like hey maybe maybe it's just not audience building that you want maybe you need to actually learn how to monetize the thing and that's when I just became completely obsessed. And that's all I talk about now. It's just audience monetization because I feel like there's a lot of content on how to grow. And I don't want, like I, I had a big pain and was kind of embarrassing, not making good money. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let me teach people how to do this because they can actually speak from a place of experience. So that's kind of where like the, um, my mantra was born, which is likes in cash, showing you how to turn all your likes into cash and make money with an audience. So you're at like 200k or something like that Twitter followers. Uh, like, what do you, what were you tweeting about, and what was your platform to get to that 200k? And then at what point did you start to really figure out how to monetize that audience? Yeah, so I started as a dating account, like a social skills dating guy. I love that. Like that was so much. Oh, fun. really? Yeah. <laughs> so cool. What was that? Uh, what's that guy? Like the game? What's his name? Neil. Neil. Uh, Neil Strauss. Yeah, Neil Strauss. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Neil Strauss. Yeah. Which, by the way, the game is a very, very cool book. You know, you know, on that game, on on that book, he's like, yeah, the pickup artists got all these girls, but in the end, they all ended up like, like soulless. You know, yeah. they couldn't establish yeah. a connection. To me, that was like, whoa, what the hell, right? But. <clears throat> Did you ever true. read, uh, what's his name, uh, Mark Manson's first book, Models? It was like the anti-pickup artist, pickup artist book. Yeah, which is actually, I, I don't know, I haven't read the entirety of it, but the parts that I read are actually pretty solid. You know? Well, like, yeah, the Neil Strauss one, you know, the game, like, yeah, it's cheesy tactics when you're, you know, in your, like when you're 18 or 20 or something, or, 20, you know, when you're 21 hitting the bar scene for the first time, it's like all the cheesy uh, pickup tactics or whatever, but uh I think the the models one was really interesting because Mark Manson talks about, you know, not trying to like use tactics and like cheesy strategies to pick up women, but just actually be genuine, like be vulnerable, be who you are, and then attract people to you that, uh, you know, that just appreciate your, your like auth authenticity. Yeah, man. Like that is also a good example of how we could tie that to audience building actually, because like figure out why people in the beginning use tactics with girls, right? They use tactics and uh, like they copy phrases because they feel like girls, what they want is like strength and confidence. And when they see it from some other dude, the guy sees it and I'm like, oh, if I just copy that, then she'll like me. But just by copying it, that means neediness. That means you don't have it, right? If you want to try to copy other people's sauces because you don't have it, right? That kind of tracks them away. And um, when you're genuine and when you're like, when you're yourself, that's kind of when she realizes I like this guy doesn't give a fuck and that strength and that like kind of not caring reveals strength in you. So that ties a little bit to what I did with audience building in the beginning. The way I grew was with 
copy paste tactics. I saw what other tweets did. I saw what other creators did. And you see this a lot on Twitter, especially a lot of people copying threads from other guys, like how to write 10 Google Chrome extensions that feel illegal to know about, or 10 uh, rules of success from Elon Musk, or 10 rules of success from Jay Bezos. Like, cool, but like, what are your rules of success? Why should I listen to you? Because everybody has kind of this unanswered question in their head, which is, why should I listen to you? Right. And so you're doing, uh, so, you, so you're doing like this, this tweet, uh, follower strategy around, uh, like, you know, picking up women, I guess, like dating. And, uh, when did you make the transition from that to, uh, audience building for businesses and for, uh, influencers? And then at, you know, how did you get that first set? Like, how did you become sort of, you know, I guess you were co copying others, but how did you even get traction initially uh, on Twitter with that uh, dating, uh, you know, tactic? Yeah, in the beginning, dating was for the first few thousand followers. Like, I didn't, I didn't keep it, and I <clears throat> like the main change came when I saw this tweet by this guy named Lawrence King, and he said he posted a picture of, the, of Gillette, you know, the razor company. So Gillette was making, they had like a hundred and thirty thousand followers on Twitter. And if you see their posts, they got like three likes. And that's like horrible, right? But he said... Was it all bots let, or something? I th maybe not even a bot. Maybe just people. Because if they were bots, it would be more than three. You know? Yeah, but, true. Yeah. But uh, Lawrence essentially said, the Gillette guy is being paid 80K a year. right? And I'm looking at that. I'm making 3K a year. Right? And I'm like, what the fuck, right? <laughs> and he said, imagine how much they would pay you if you didn't suck at your job. Like, okay, that makes sense, right? So then I was kind of thinking, okay, well, what am I good at? I'm like, okay, I'm good at writing tweets. So let me talk to other people to write their tweets for them. So I started doing outreach and got a client. That, that was like my first Twitter business, ghostwriting. I would write for everybody else and kind of grow their accounts because that's kind of just all I need. All I knew how to do at the time, which was write tweets. Interesting. Um, so what? Uh, so you built Tweet Hunter, and uh, talk a little bit about what Tweet Hunter does. Yeah. So Tweet Hunter essentially allows you to grow and monetize your audience fast on Twitter. And I didn't build it on my own. I actually didn't build it at all. I made a point with uh, my team, guys. We're gonna build a big company, and I don't want anybody in this team to tell me what programming language it's written in. Like, I don't want to know. I still don't know. It makes $1.5 million a year. I don't know what programming language is written in. But um, essentially, the program is allows you to schedule tweets. And it was built by these two French entrepreneurs, Thibaut and Thomas. And they built this really cool tool. At the time, I was ghostwriting. And I ghostwrote with like three or four tools. But they kind of put it all in one, which I really liked. And I asked somebody like, yo, I see this really cool tool and they have like no audience, right? To promote it. And I have like this big audience, but I don't have a product. So, you know, two plus two equals four. So I'm like, okay, that makes sense. So we just partner up and the product was already built. <clears throat> I was just came in as kind of the, like you said in the beginning, <laughs> tell me where do you want them to click and I'll make them click. So I became kind of the voice. They became kind of the, the product behind it. Okay, cool. And, yeah. uh, so, so you're kind of, uh, you know, building this, this SaaS business in the Twitter space. And then, uh, you know, if I go to your Twitter bio and I click the, uh, I think it's the jkmolina.com link, it takes me to a page that has like 20 buttons on it. I see there's like a gum road course. There's, you know, the tweet hunter, there's all these different, you know, I, I don't even know. There's all these different things on there. Uh, what is, what is all that? Like, what is, what are all these things that you're doing? Yeah, that, that was I would call that straight up bullshit, dude, because what happened was I got banned from Twitter ads early in 2020. From Twitter ads it, or just from Twitter, Twitter in general? Twitter ads Twitter and Twitter in general. <laughs> That's another story. Do people even <laughs> uh, like Twitter ads? I, you know, I haven't heard too many people having success on Twitter ads. Have you had success on Twitter ads? No, because I'm banned. But I've heard, a lot, <laughs> I've heard a lot of people get great return on, on ad spend on Twitter ads. Like the thing about Twitter ads, is they don't like it when you promise things or when you include guarantees. So for example, if I wanted to promote a certain product that says you double your money or your money back, that's like a standard offer. I can't say that. But what I can say is, 
hey, Brian tried this product, it doubled his money and I put it all in a video, check it out. I can't say that. You can't be too explicit in Twitter ads. And at the time I didn't know, so I fucked it up and I got banned. Right. So you can't, you can't make claims. Is that what you're saying? Like you can't say double your, I mean, that's a guarantee. It's like you double your money on this or you get your money back. I is that, why is that against their terms of service? Do you think? Beats me, bro. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. I've been trying to appeal for so long, but the reason why I have that kind of bullshit website on my Twitter link right now, it's because they didn't want anything associated to a guarantee on my website. So if you click on any of those buttons you see on my website, it actually takes you back to Twitter to all my threads. And that's kind of behave well while I appeal to get my Twitter account back. And it's bullshit, dude. I want to get it. And like, I know so many people that have been banned for like the smallest things, like this small guarantee or this small case study. So and you can even log into Twitter helpful. now? No, I can't log into Twitter. I just can't run ads. Ah, Okay. And yeah, then did you, did you say your actual account got banned on Twitter at one point too, or? Oh yeah, dude, that was bad. So I was what at did like, you do to get banned? <laughs> I was, I was at like 14K followers, right? And I got banned. And what happened was I set up a Twitter account when I was like nine or 10 years old, you know, cause it was like the cool thing, right? Everybody was running Facebook in, in school. So I did one uh, on Twitter and apparently you can't create a Twitter account if you're not at least 13 years old. Right. But it, when I created when I was nine, I lied about my age. But you know how on your birthday on Twitter, it shows these really cool things where it has like balloons and stuff and it looks really pretty. And I was like, yeah, I kind of want that. So it was it was dumb. So I changed my actual date of birth. And when they realized I was nine years old, when I created my account, they banned me. Well, I'm surprised that, that they even have that. I mean, did, is that like a human reviewing that or is that somehow like in their algorithm or like in their uh code that they're identifying for that for twitter ads i think it's uh it's a it's a human right because they got to analyze the guarantees but for age i don't think that's too complex so i think it's computers programmatic yeah interesting all right so you got banned on twitter ads you got banned on twitter what's next are you going for like tiktok or something to get banned there Dude, you, real talk i think i'm gonna get banned next if i could i'm trying not to but if I would get banned on the platform next, it would be LinkedIn. Mm. Uh, and the reason why it's because I'm, I come very much from the direct response world. And the way I think about marketing is very direct. I don't like, I know branding is important and I see the importance of it. I just don't believe it when people only say stuff like, Hey, I'm just here to um, make friends. I'm just here to build connections and add value. Like, no, dude, like you're here to make money. Like, let's just be honest about it, right? So um, I don't I don't like bullshit marketing. And there's a, I've noticed a few of that in LinkedIn. So uh, that might be the platform where I get banned next because they are very, like, they're, they're light on the trigger on that. Like, it happens a lot. Like, for example, let's say you posted something on LinkedIn. I had a call with Tim Denning a few days ago. He showed me this. And all, in, all I need to do to suspend your account for a bit or at least put it on review is to tell three of my friends to report your post. Like, it doesn't matter what it says. If three people report it, then they will see it. And to me, that's just not cool. <laughs> what do you, so what's your strategy on LinkedIn? Are you just copying and pasting the Twitter strategy to LinkedIn? Or what's the, what's the strategy there? Yeah, I actually crafted SOPs today for my virtual assistant. So I can go over those if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the I guess the the heart of what I want to learn from you is like, what is, you know, you've got like all these things going on, but what's like your core mission right now? Like, what are you working on? What are you trying to build? What do you want? What what buttons do you want people to click right now? <laughs> yeah. So the one button I like people to click right now, it's uh, to subscribe to my OnlyFans. Really, that's like the most important <laughs> thing to me at the moment. But that's a premium offer. So let's talk about the other offer. <laughs> no, like, okay. So the main one was. <clears throat> I don't think I'm going to be a customer to your, to your OnlyFans. I'm sorry, man. Oh, uh, dude, <laughs> what are we doing here? Fuck. Well, if anybody's <laughs> listening to this, now you know. But <clears throat> it's okay. I forgive you. No, because here's the thing. Um, okay, this, this podcast is going to go out in a few days. But anyway, I, I don't think I've told about, I've said this uh, before, but uh, we sold Tweet Hunter. Right, we sold it, we're acted it, we're out, right? At least I'm out. Tibo and Thomas, I think they're gonna stay for a bit, but I'm out, right? We sold it. And um, 
one of the mistakes I made while I was a tweet hunter is that I focused on other businesses that were not tweet hunter. You know, so I started doing the Molina letter, which is a community and a subscription. I started doing Bonaro, which is a course in a cohort with at Lattimore. And I I just started doing too many things, man. And um it was like I saw, I saw bow and arrow on gum road. Yeah. And by the way, that course is outdated. You shouldn't download it, but I keep it because some people still have it. But anyway, so I uh, started too many businesses. It was kind of arrogant of me and honestly an experience to assume that I was going to be able to juggle that many things at the same time. So now I exited that. I cut other businesses. And now my sole focus and my one thing is focusing on this coaching program called Tweets and Clients where I show people how to monetize their audiences, not grow, monetize their audiences. And this is something I love. I'm deeply passionate about. And this is like my one thing besides the only sense. (laughs) So uh, why, um, why coaching? I mean, that's like, that's like trading time for money, right? Like you're doing direct, uh, direct consulting, or uh, is it more of like a productized coaching offer? Yeah. So it's, um, it's a ladder. It's more of a productized coaching offer. I realized and that I'm like, I have the most fun in the acquisition side of the business, getting people in the door, getting people to click buttons, right? And I feel like that's why Tweet Hunter works so well. Tivo and Thomas were world class at not making me look at any line of code or worrying about anything about product. They told me, like, you ever seen Avengers and and <laughs> they're like, Captain America is giving everybody instructions. He just goes to Hulk and says, like, Hulk. You smash, right? They said they did the same thing with me. Like, JK, you get people in the door. I'm like, bet I can do that. Okay. And I realized that was something I really liked. So I actually only focus on the acquisition side of tweets and clients. And I partner up with Ryan. So Ryan Booth and Ryan, world class operators, systems, fulfillment. He does that. He's that arm of the business. And he's actually a CEO of the business. I'm the CMO. So when it comes to me, I'm not really trading time for money and Ryan's taking care of the operation. So it's a really nice business. Who's Ryan? What is, uh, what's his background? Uh, So Ryan, I don't know much about his background, but I know he's on, he's been focusing a lot on systems and operations out of the agencies. He did co-found a VA agency and then kind of helps other founders with systems and operations. And he was my coach because I ran the program. And in the beginning it was fine, but as more people started coming in, I was like, okay, this is, this is too much. Like I can't fulfill so much. So I came up to him for uh, systems and ops, right? And didn't know what to do. And during that process, I realized like, dude, like this guy is excellent at this. So why don't we just partner up? And like, I always tell Ryan, here's our division in the business. You are the business and I am the show business. And this is how we make money because I bring the clients in and he fulfills. Cool, cool. So, um, uh, how how old are you, by the way? You, you seem like you've been. Uh, you seem like you're pretty young, but like, how many? How old are you? And how many? How, how many years have you you've been doing companies for? I um, started my first perfume door to door entrepreneurship venture in at seventeen, but I'm twenty two. Cool, that's awesome, man. So you've been doing sure. it for five years, uh, and you're in Guatemala, right? I'm in Guatemala, born and raised, and probably will keep living here. Like, it. yeah, yeah. I've I've, I've been. I haven't been to Guatemala. I've been to other countries in LATAM and it's a awesome spot. I was just talking to another guy who's uh, he's lived all over the world. Uh, he was on our show, uh, Ray, Ray Blackney. Uh, and he lives in Mexico and uh, he was talking about like, you know, the power of building internet companies that make us dollars and then living in Mexico and like paying like one quarter of what, you know, oh, what right. the U S dollar rate is for like rent and, you know, all your utilities and, you know, living expenses. It's like an arbitrage opportunity to live like a king in Latin America. Bro, you have no idea. Like to me, let's say a client pays like 2000, right? For me, if I want to buy, and this is my unit of measurement in Guatemala, you want to buy eight coconuts. You can buy eight coconuts with $1, eight coconuts, full, big $1. So what I do is I take my bag and I go to the corner, I buy my coconuts and just take it back to my apartment. And it's awesome. Like with $5, I actually needed more people to help me carry coconuts. 
<laughs> it's Dude, awesome. If I go to Whole Foods right now in Philadelphia, I think one coconut is probably like $5. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> See, too many people talking about the about inflation. Nobody, nobody, you know, no, not enough people talking about coconut inflation you know that's important this is we important. need to make a uh maybe this is a website for you i don't know you could do like peter levels or something with you know he has all these businesses that he does like uh you know inflation charts and stuff but you need to be the coconut index guy so you create like the uh the federal guatemalan coconut index and uh track the price of coconuts you know to the u.s dollar and then use that as like a financial uh measurement to uh you know track the, the world economy it's so good, man. And like, I feel like because it's, it costs so little to live here and I actually recommend this to younger entrepreneurs is to, you have nothing to lose, right? Because whatever happens, let's say you have like, I don't know, you have like $5,000 saved up. That's like seven months, you know, or more that you could live without making a sense. So it allows you to make bigger bets. You know, cool. and like something that I think was kind of an advantage for me now that you mentioned Guatemala, a lot of people tell me like, hey, I, that was a big disadvantage. And uh, how did you do that with those harsh conditions? And honestly, the more I think about it, the more I think it was an advantage because I like, like I had nothing to lose. I can just take bigger bets. So for me, it's like I remember when I made when I made like 5K in a month. That's like bank executive salary where I live. And to me, it was like, dude, I made it. So I could make so many bigger bets and fun stuff with my own cash. And I didn't fear any result, which I don't think would have happened if I, for example, lived in Miami or New York or Austin, right? Which is why I don't like living in the US. I wouldn't live in the US ever. But uh, I just feel like this was, <clears throat> I don't know, kind of a blessing in disguise. And I like people to kind of look at it that way like if you're from a place that's not too affluent that's kind of a good thing if you really put your work into it you know yeah yeah especially in a global economy uh have you been to the u.s before i have i lived in austin for um for a few months that used to be a lot cheaper but now it's like san francisco <clears throat> prices almost all the people from california just uh fled out to austin and utah and all these places and now like the housing prices have like doubled in the last two years it's bad there, there was a lot of people and i didn't like it i didn't like living in america because i've i've talked about this with with some of my twitter friends a lot of people on twitter live in miami new york san francisco texas and i don't know if you have this because you're in new york aren't you i'm in philly but i i live right uh, in the city so it's like similar to new york oh okay <clears throat> Well, you live in a busy place. Uh, do you ever feel that living in such a busy place makes you rush? Yeah, but I actually like it. Uh, I like that. I like the speed at which stuff happens here in, in Philly. Philly and New York are similar. Uh, they're like unique places. There's nowhere else in the United States or really anywhere that I've been in the world other than maybe like London or something that has this kind of feel where it's just like everything is so fast. It's you know, people are thinking quick, moving quick, talking quick. And it's just like this energy. You can just literally feel it being in the city. And I live here. So I feel the energy. Like I can look out my windows here and I have a 360 degree view of the city. I just see skyscrapers all around my apartment. And uh, and that's like, I, I love being in that sort of energy. Great. Well, it works for you, right? They didn't work for me. So I just feel like <laughs> I, made, I made rushed decisions, which I didn't like. I like making... I, I enjoy the patience that I have in a place where nothing happens, like where I live, you know, and I can play more patient games and I just enjoy it. So I, I didn't like it. And do you now, live in a, in a rural area or is it more like uh, a town or something? Or I live in the I live in the capital, but it's not the main place of the capital. Like Latin, Latin American cities are a bit different. Uh, in Guatemala, there is no like downtown, right? Because I feel like the more you like in Austin, at least, or Miami, I said it's like Brickell, and then there's like Austin, which is South Congress. And it kind of, the more you stay away, like the more rural it is. Like Guatemala City is kind of just a suburb all throughout, you know? So I live in some place around there, but um, it's never busy here. And you don't see a lot of stuff going on because it's just not that safe. So people don't leave that much, but it's just not much goes on, you know? Interesting. Yeah, it's... um. 
one of the guys on our team uh, at, at my company, Kurotech, uh, is actually um, doing a uh, he's doing like a digital nomad thing. And he's he's from the U.S. He's from the Philly area, but he's been uh, living in uh, Medellin. And I think he's in Cali now. And then I don't know where he's going next, but he's you know doing a little LATAM tour right now, which is pretty cool. I'm following him on Instagram and watching all his videos and seems like he's partying it up. <laughs> you ever you ever considered going to Latam? Yeah, I've been. Yeah, I've been to uh, Peru a few times. I've been to uh, Medellin. Uh, I've been to um, been a few places in the Caribbean. I've been to Mexico uh, several times. I've been to uh, a few different places in Mexico. What's your favorite? Uh, what's my favorite? Um, uh, I have friends in in Lima, so uh, I enjoy visiting them, and uh, I always have a great time in Lima. I've actually never been to Machu Picchu or Cusco, but uh, I've been to Lima a few times. Uh, mostly, you know, like downtown, you know, like this center city part of Lima, you know, like La Molina or not La Molina. Um, what's it called? Uh, That's me. Yeah, you're Molina. No, there, there's a there's a town in in uh, in Lima called La Molina, uh, but no, like. Uh, uh, Barranco, and then there's uh, uh, Miraflores is the place, and oh, okay. uh, San Isidro are the two, pl the three places I've been. All the places in are called the same Latin America. Like I live close to a place named Miraflores, and there's oh, really? some, I, I know a place called San Isidro because they were all conquered by the Spanish, right? So they conquered the whole thing. It's all called the same. Like, well, with Miraflores, I mean, it's like something flowers, right? What is it? What does it mean? Uh, it's like looking at flowers, like seeing oh, flowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, San Isidro is probably a saint. <clears throat> but, Something, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, man, this is where I run my business and um, different ways to go about it, I guess. Yeah, so, um, all right, I have to ask, is the uh, OnlyFans a joke or is that a real thing? It's a joke, it's a joke. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> You'd go in a totally different direction on this podcast <laughs> if that was uh, a real thing. I'd have a whole bunch of questions for you about that. But, Imagine uh, that, dude. That's, that's, my, that's my funnel. That's what I do. But nah. Dude, you're like an expert clickbait marketer. Like people are going to go to OnlyFans and then they're going to get there. They have, to, they have to click next like 25 times and you've got like an ad arbitrage going. And <laughs> that, that's kind of my that's kind of my Twitter philosophy. I I use kind of the most clickbaity methods to get you to read my stuff, but I make my stuff the best I can. You know, so it's usually clickbait and shit content. I try to do clickbait, hard clickbait, and I'll use the dirtiest techniques to get you to click on stuff. But I'll try to make the content the best I can because I actually believe that you need to give people what they want in order to give them what they need. And a lot of people, I feel, fail on Twitter and they go with, dude, I'm posting so much value, but nobody's listening. Like, man, look at this thread. I put my soul into it, but nobody's listening. And it's because you're leading, like if you were turn, to turn in a plate, right, with like steak and salad, you're leading with the salad. So, of course, nobody's going to eat the steak. So, you turn it around. You lead with the sexy thing and eventually you're going to give them what they need after. That's kind of how I look at Twitter always. I try to make people click on shit however I can. And then I try to blow them away with value because I know that I can't just give one thing. I need to do both dichotomies. So let's brainstorm the uh, the clickbait title for this podcast. Uh, we'll just we'll we'll make the title right now. Let's figure out what it is. So uh, I want to make the make the title right now. Yeah, let's 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 make the title. So we'll we'll come up. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we throw something in there like uh, you know from from OnlyFans creator to two hundred thousand Twitter followers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you could go to from two hundred fifty dollars a month virtual assistant. To seven figure exit to OnlyFans superstar. Here's the story. Well, that's, oh, that's actually uh, that's good, man. You uh, you just I think you nailed it right there. I think that's what we're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. It's um, it's a fun it's a fun game. And now I'm getting into YouTube because I I partnered up with this guy named Quinn Quinn Fulmer, and he has this this YouTube brain, man. Like he'll give me prompts as in, okay, JK, when you start a video, you say this. And then you glimpse at the rest of the video. And then you do this. And then in the end, you end like this. Like you realize that even though you may understand kind of the psychology behind getting people to click, every platform is such a different animal, right? So it's harder. It's not impossible, but it's it, like you need to really catch an eye and dedicate a few months at least to learning one platform and then another one and another one to at least be competent at it. I thought because I was good at Twitter, I was going to nail it on YouTube and then launched a few videos and they got like two views. I'm like, okay, what the fuck? Like, there's something wrong. <laughs> so I had it's, to it's so true, man. 
I mean, we're we're doing on the just on this podcast. I have a production team, and uh, you know, we started out by going out to all the podcast platforms and focusing on the audio downloads. And now our first social uh, platform that we're trying to you know uh, tackle is YouTube. So I I told the team, don't even worry about like Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn or any of that stuff yet. We're not going to do it. We're going to focus on YouTube first. And, uh, and like the strategy we're trying to use, I'm curious to get your, your opinion on this and we can like riff on it, but the strategy we're trying to use and it's starting to work, we're starting to get some traction with it is we have three types of content. We have the full episode content, which is not really like, we don't try to drive from the YouTube search and the YouTube algorithm. We don't necessarily try to drive people directly there. Uh, the full episode is the end destination from the episodes. We create, we like five or six shorts from each episode. And we like make those shorts like clickbaity and like try to get try to get into the YouTube algorithm on the shorts and then the shorts call to action to the full form episode. And then for YouTube search, we're trying to create segments and chopping up like five to 15 minute segments out of the episode where we're talking about one specific topic. And then we keyword optimize those segments for YouTube search. So we've got like on the app, you got the shorts on the like the web version of YouTube. When people are searching in the search box, we've got the the segment content that's like, by, you know, it's not super short, but it's not super long. And then everything drives people to the user, to the uh, to the full form episode and to subscribe. That's kind of what we're going after now. Uh, is that how you would attack it or uh, how would you attack it? Yeah, so the way I would attack it is not that relevant to you because I'm not that big, right? However, I will tell you what has worked recently that I think is going to be cool. So I don't have TikTok and I don't, I don't check Instagram Reels, but I did check the YouTube Shorts tab. And man, every time I checked that thing, I was there for like an hour and a half. It was crazy. Like it just sucked my time out. And one time I was like, okay, at least let me, let me get something productive out of it. So I started seeing why those were interesting. And something that caught my eye is, well, first it's half Andrew Tate. And second is that a lot of the big viral he's, content. Uh, he's arrested now. Yeah, yeah. I don't. We don't know if it's true though, but I think. I think anyway. Yeah. But but... Something. Something that caught my attention was in every single podcast clip that I saw, it was somebody telling a story of Joe Rogan telling a gorilla story of Andrew Tate telling a cigar story. Right. It was stories, stories, stories. So then I try to do it for my own. So on my podcast. I stopped giving so much hard advice and I started telling people stories of how I learned the advice. And recently, those have been the shorts that have been performing the best. So now I'm thinking, and I told Quinn, yo, check this out. It's stories that are doing best, not hard advice. So how about we double down on it, right? So he's like, dude, we should do that. So now we're focusing more on stories. So something you could try if you'd like is when you prepare questions for the people you're gonna interview, Ask them in a way that gets them to tell things. How'd you learn that? How'd you come up with that? Where'd you learn this, right? And if you do that, I feel like it starts picking up more traction. So I'm figuring out the game as I go, right? But I just wanted to maybe share that nugget with you. And for the audience, if you want to record something, get your guy to tell stories because those are performing really good. Yeah, I totally see that in our our data too. Uh, so one interesting uh you know, an interesting story I've heard. Uh, so a friend of mine has a tech publication up here in Philly. They do, you know, all over, they do multiple cities in the U S but they're like a prominent tech publication. And he was getting into like cracking TikTok in the last like year or two, trying to figure out how to use TikTok and how to, you know, optimize, uh, for traffic and, and, uh, subscribers. And he described it to me like this. He says, all right, Brian. So like, you know how you go to a party, and everyone's drinking and uh you know and that's like the drinking's like facebook and then someone calls you into a back room they're like yo i got something back here and then you go back and they're all smoking weed and uh and then that's that's twitter and then you're you're in the twitter room and then some other some other guy like taps you on the shoulder he's like yo man i got something you know come back here in this other back room and you go back in that back room and they're smoking crack and that's tiktok <laughs> <laughs> so uh, TikToks were crackers or something. <laughs> oh god. Okay. I will say, man, what I've seen on, on Twitter, I don't know if it's pot, but people have a nicotine issue on Twitter. Everybody's a nicotine, like hard or like a lot, you know, and they got me into it, man. Do you you take that? 
Yeah, you know, every now and then I'll smoke a cigar, but not really, uh, not a big smoker. The one thing, I hated everything about Texas except two things. Well, three. One was the company because I lived with cool people, Dan Coe and Dakota Robertson. Two that I didn't hate was the jujitsu because Austin, Texas has the best jujitsu in the world. And the three that are the, like the thing that I love the most about Texas, bro, it was the nicotine pouches. You guys on America have the Zims, the things you put like three and people six. People don't do that in Philly, man. That's like a, that's a Southern thing. Oh, really? Yeah. People don't do that stuff in Philly. Oh man. Well, you guys, Philly, you're all missing out. That thing's awesome. Right. <laughs> so I tested that out in Texas and I loved it. So th- those three things were the best. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, like I want to get back to the, I want to get back to the crack and, and marijuana example. So can you, can you elaborate on that? Cause I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. He, he's just making the joke. Like, you know, you go on Facebook and it's like, you know, it used to be the thing. And, uh, but like TikTok is just, you know, it's like super short content and people just like, they go, they open up the app and then next thing they know, it's like two hours later and they just scrolled through, you know, 500 videos, just like, you know, it's like you scroll to a video, it's like 10 seconds. It's like infuse your brain with dopamine. And then it's like, all right, next infuse your brain with dopamine. And then next, you know, dopamine. And it's just yeah. like this endless stream of just like short form, like dopamine hits and uh and they they they've short like the brightest minds in of our generation in the world are figuring out how to get you to continue scrolling on apps like they're not landing people on the moon they're not like inventing cures for you know uh diseases they're like getting you to figure out they're figuring out how to get you to stay on the app longer and hit more scrolls well with youtube shorts it worked certainly stories so there's that. Well, YouTube Shorts was just like a literally copy and paste of TikTok strategy because TikTok came on the scene and then Google's like, shit, we need to build YouTube Shorts. And then, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Facebook's like, shit, we need Instagram Reels. And then we're going to put Instagram Reels on Facebook because Facebook's dying. And then, you know, it's, uh, you know, basically like they just all copied TikTok. Like TikTok did it first. Yeah. And in the beginning, remember how Snapchat had stories? Instagram didn't have stories. But they copied it from Snapchat. Remember yeah. that? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of that, by the way. I'm a big fan of seeing what works and straight up copying it. And I'm not even ashamed of it. Right. I will copy thread hooks. I will copy business models because like it works, you know, and if you can help other people with it, it's not unethical. You can do it. So I have a I, sometimes here in Guatemala, dude. So some some people found out about the tweet hunter thing. I usually try to keep it on the low, uh, especially here in Guatemala. But a few people found out and they were like turning in prizes, right? And the prize was for the most disruptive businesses of Guatemala, right? And I saw like the guy I was competing with for the prizes. Some people were like, you know, like Web3 and like and like blockchain technology and like solar. And now it's my turn to get on stage, right? And explain what does Tweet Hunter do that's so disrupted that'll change the world, right? So I go up and they ask me, okay, what does Tweet Hunter do? And I'm like, okay, I can either bullshit or I can just say the truth. I'm like, okay, guys, Tweet Hunter schedules tweets. And that's it. That was, that was my entire thing. <laughs> and you can, you can see how everybody's kind of expecting me to say more, like, Okay. Oh, like with Elon Musk, I'm like, I mean, Elon owns Twitter, but I just, I just do tweets, and you could see the disappointment in their faces, as in, oh God, really? But why? Like why would? Tweet. Why would someone use Tweet Hunter instead of Buffer? Like, what does Tweet Hunter do that Buffer doesn't do? Uh, well, I think it's a big part of the positioning, and it kind of goes back in the beginning. And you can use Buffer, and you can use whatever you want. Really, they kind of all do the same, but. We try to be very direct when it came to Tweet Hunter in our positioning. We're a tool that ha- helps you make money. So when you join Tweet Hunter, like let's say you join Buffer, you join Buffer or other schedulers, and you can start writing tweets, right? On Tweet Hunter, we never let you tweet. We don't let you do shit before you read both the growth and the monetization guide. Because we wanted to show you that this is a tool to make money. So, for example, it's differences in positioning. So they they're there to like increase your presence and help you grow. We tell you, hey, you make money, and if you don't make money on the first month, let us know, and you get your money back. So, so like buffer that. is like just a tool, and you are like 
a tool that guides you on how to use the tool? I guess they're both tools. They're both tools. We just speak differently. We just position ourselves differently because people don't make buying decisions. I found just based on what you promise. People buy take buying decisions based on which road you're going to take them through. Like let's take fitness, for example. I hired a fitness coach. And the reason why I hired my fitness coach is because he sold me the dream of being able to be fit without hard diets or cardio, right? It's the same goal as other fitness coaches that told me, hey, you're going to get to your dream body, but we're going to do it through sprinting. Like, fuck that, right? Like, no, it's not happening because people don't only make decisions based on the outcome, but on the road. So what we did was we can't promise a better outcome than Buffer. I mean, you're going to grow your Twitter account. But what we can do is we can offer a different road from you being able to figure out everything out on your own to us showing you how the greatest people on Twitter do it. So we didn't change the destination. We changed the road, which is the positioning. If you, uh, if you ever get to pitch again, you can work on your Silicon Valley uh, pitch style and you can say, uh, uh, Tweet Hunter is making the world a better place through optimized automated tweet scheduling technology platforms. Yeah, but then I couldn't sleep that night. Because I know I'd be, I don't like, I don't like bullshitting, man. Just throw in like, throw in a bunch of buzzwords, like say AI and blockchain and cloud. And then, you know, uh, automated machine learning, tweet scheduling, uh, innovation, you know, just put all the buzzwords in and you're good. (laughs) That's another big reason why I didn't go harder into SaaS and startups because, and I'm, I'm generalizing, right? So don't take this at face value, but I just didn't vibe with the industry. I'm more direct response. I'm, I'm, the, I'm more the marketer at times. I'm more that like direct, honest, cut to the chase kind of kind of guy. So that's why I enjoyed coaching a lot, and I enjoy my side of Twitter a lot, which is quote unquote money Twitter, because I just feel like it's a little bit more honest and more close to me. So that's why I went that route and not more on the SaaS. I'm not going into SaaS again soon, at least. I don't like it. Why not? I mean, I. I... I don't fully get that. I mean, it feels like, uh, you know, it feels like, you know, you've got the ability to productize what you're doing on Twitter. Uh, I think Tweet Hunter is a great example. It's such a simple product. And, you know, you got it to like, what, 1.5 ARR? Mm-hmm. It's a little I mean, bit more now, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's amazing. Like SaaS, not anymore. It's probably like a 5x valuation now. I don't know what your valuation was when you sold it, but uh you know, you could get like 10x, you know, last year. It was 1x valuation. 1x valuation on the sale? Yeah, I one for four mil. One for four million. It is low. Yeah. And um been having like mixed thoughts on that. Some one is didn't really enjoy working there. So that that was good. Second one was I was actually I got lazy and wasn't competent enough to take it to the next level because at some point. Just making people click a button isn't enough. You can't just get more customers. You can you have to make every single customer worth more. And I didn't have that skill set. And I got too lazy to learn that skill set. So that was a big one. <clears throat> but what uh who who bought it? Was it like a, a it's a or? it's Lempire. So Lempire, like Lemless, they Oh they yeah, were, yeah. Lempire. Yeah. Okay. Was yeah, he the, was he working with you guys on the product as well? Or he just uh what's that guy? Guillerme or something or Guillaume? Guillaume. Uh, Guillaume. Guillaume. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. But um no, the the cool thing about it is we actually paid a broker to help us find somebody to buy it. Fucking useless, nothing happened, right? But then Tibo and so Guillaume and Tibo and Thomas, they're all French, right? But Tibo and Guillaume actually went to the same high school together. Here's the crazy <laughs> thing, too. And they had lunch in Paris. And Guillaume was he does cold email, like Lemless, it's it's cold email, right? But he realized that cold email works so much better when you have a strong personal brand. Because it, let's say Brian sends an email, like they're just not going to see Brian. They're going to click on your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter profile, and see who you are, like if you're legit. And Tebo and Thomas grew Tweet Hunter and Tapio, which Tapio is like Tweet Hunter, but for LinkedIn. And they saw, oh, like we could just copy it, right? Just copy and paste the code. I'm obviously generalizing here, but it's kind of the same thing. And then Guillaume saw it and said, like, oh, dude, this is perfect. Right. So that that way they combined. So Tweet Hunter and Tapio both sold for a combined two million dollars. Dude, I Guillaume, only... his his energy on camera, man. He's like 
he he should be like a game show host or something man he's got like the best like presence on camera i love that guy and uh we were actually we were talking about him on episode five actually uh i had uh my friend mike benson on who built warmupinbox.com and sold that a few years ago and uh and he you know same thing he built that from zero to you know multi seven figures in uh in revenue in arr within 11 months and uh sold it and at the time he built it because the only option on the market was lemwarm if you wanted to warm your inboxes yeah. for cold email your only option was lemwarm and it, you, if you wanted to sign up for lemwarm you had to buy the entire lemlist package which was like 99 dollars a month and if you only wanted the warming feature it was so expensive to buy let to buy lemlist and pay 99 dollars a month per inbox to warm your inbox so my friend mike built warm up inbox and charge $9 per inbox per month and just like crushed it, man. In a year, he got like tens of thousands of signups and, uh, and eventually sold it to private, to a private equity firm. But, uh, yeah, we were talking all about Lemlist on episode five. Yeah. That guy is smart, man. That guy gets it. He's, he thinks a lot of steps ahead because he's so cold email, right? And cold email is not going anywhere anytime soon. Like it's, it's a great method, right? But he saw that the people who just had a stronger personal brand had so much more success with cold email, right? So what it, that's why I think he was most interested on Tweet Hunter and Tablio because that allows you to grow the brand, right? And just being real, he was even more interested on Tablio, which is the LinkedIn version, not so much Tweet Hunter. It was more Tablio because he believes more in, on, on LinkedIn. Right, more than Twitter. Yeah, it makes sense. So, so the other, so you built the other one too. What's it called? Tapio. Taplio. Taplio. So that's also uh, one of the products you built at the same time as Tweet Hunter. So I'm not. Okay, so Pony Express, that's the like the mother company, owns Tweet Hunter and owns Tapio. I only have equity on Tweet Hunter. Ah, uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah Tapio um, for for LinkedIn. Yeah, that makes sense for. Uh, for Lem for Lempire because uh, I think they're mostly like you know cold emails B two B so if you're doing cold email you you're not doing that to end consumers you're doing that to B two B you know it's business sales so uh, you know LinkedIn's kind of like the de facto uh, platform for for B two B social uh, networking yeah dude those guys got it like they're they're smart man they're smart and um, well that's what happened to them. And then after we did that, so I couldn't announce the sale. I, actually, I can't announce it today. I can announce it in 10 days, depending on All where right. you'll be watching this podcast. We'll, uh, we'll hold the episode then until January 15th. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I got another yeah. one that uh, is uh, another one of my guests is uh, he's not officially leaving uh, the company yet. He's still the CTO, but I think he's officially leaving on like January 9th or something. And it's a unicorn. So they're a multi-billion dollar valuation, private company in the United States. He was one, he was like one of the first 10 employees and you know, CTO and helped build the company to like a thousand employees or something. And uh he's leaving and starting a new company now. But I had I'm holding the episode until January 9th when the announcement is officially public. What a legend. <laughs> that'd be good fuck yeah dude so many people at such higher levels man that that's the cool thing about social media and the coolest thing about social media is money i do believe that like deep down second coolest thing is you just get so much access to everybody you know and if you have an audience even though you may not be as competent because i'm not as competent as guillaume or these guys right but why am i on the same podcast as that as that guy because like if you have a certain amount of clout on social media, they people kind of treat you differently. That's something I also like about I like the audience. You're like you can be widely known in narrow circles. Yeah, I mean you can't. You know, there's there's only a few people. I mean, you know, I there's so many business CEOs. Like, do you know who the CEO of Apian is? Like, you know, they're a multi billion dollar company that's like crushing it in the no code software development space. They're like the number one company in the space. But like, do you know who the CEO is? Uh, really? They're, you know, it's like that guy's probably worth, I don't know. Let's, here, let's look it up real quick. Yeah. I'm just curious. We'll, uh, we'll see. Uh, I got to leave in like three minutes, but we can. Oh, okay. Soon, so, yeah. I will right, we'll close here. Uh, APN CEO. All right. Let's see. All right. It's uh, Matt Calkins. All right. Let's see. Uh, Matt Calkins net worth. Uh, so he's got, 
Oh, it's a lot smaller than I thought. His net worth is $125 million, but uh, so he's not a billionaire, but, uh, but yeah, massive company, not, publicly not traded. Not precisely small, you know? <laughs> that's, that's also like, there's a lot of anonymous people. When I went to Austin, uh, I got some great advice. I read on Twitter from our friend Lobo and Lobo said, join the most expensive gym you can because you'll get great connections. Because honestly, like bro, Tesla, Google, all the like big companies are in Austin. Do you know what the CTO of Tesla looks like? Do you know what the COO or the second in command looks like of that department? You don't, but maybe they go to the Equinox in Austin. So it would make sense to go to the coolest gym you can because you just never know who you might find. Good advice, man. I think that's a good note to close on. Uh, JK, awesome uh, chatting with you today. And thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, man. It was a great podcast. And uh, everybody, follow me at 1JK Molina. Or if you're more of an OnlyFans kind of person, well, we're going to have to wait for that. Join the wait list. Yeah, Yeah. let let me know when you launch your OnlyFans. I'll see you, man. Ah, (laughs) bye-bye. Yeah.